Okay, hello, sorry. Um, okay, so I'm going to pick up where I left off at the end last time, and I've already written the four points on the white, right whiteboard here, although they're perhaps not completely readable, but anyway. Um, um, right, these, these four points are, again, Hume's argu skeptical argument about uh, belief in matters of fact, what I called remote matters of fact, matters of fact beyond present sense um, or, uh, in the, or memory. So, um, and so there's basically four steps to the argument. I talked about three of them last time. I didn't really get to the last one, right? The first one is that he says, well, um, whenever we have beliefs about these remote matters of fact, it's always a result of inf inferring from some effect back to a cause. So the effect is something that we actually sense or remember, and the cause is what we're inferring to, basically. Um, um, and I went to, into some complications about, you know, the difference between if it's a past cause or a cause of something we expect to happen in the future, but one way or another it involves this inference from what I now sense or remember sensing to something else that I don't sense or remember sensing. Um, and he says, well, so this presupposes a connection between the fact and what we infer from it, right? I mean, you can't infer, infer from the effect to the cause unless we know that there's some kind of regular connection between that cause and this effect. And then the next step is, and we only learn about connections like that from experience. So that's the point where um, Locke disagrees, right? I mean, Locke mostly agrees. He mo Locke mostly agrees that we have sensitive knowledge of what we're currently sensing and what we remember also, I guess. Um, but the, beyond that, we only have probability because all we know is basically the same thing Hume says we know, what things have gone together in the past. But Locke does think that in some few limited cases, only really important, limited cases, we do see a necessary connection between ideas. So we don't have to learn from experience. We can infer something about the remote matter of fact without having to base ourselves on experience. Right? Like we know that if a body changes its motion, it's due to impulse. Um, so, uh, or even more simply, we know that when we feel the sensation that Locke calls solidity, or the idea of solidity, we know that that was caused by something that will resist other bodies moving into its space while it remains there. We haven't learned that from experience, according to Locke. That's somehow evident from the ideas. Whereas, so, so, but Hume argues that we always only know this from experience. And then the last step is that experience doesn't give us a reason to believe in this connection. Um, and he argues for this, I mean, it's a pretty straightforward argument, I guess, once you accept these three points. He says, well, so the way experience teaches us that there's this connection is that we've seen the connection many times in the past. Right, so either we've seen, well, I mean, what it really always comes down to, I think, is that we've seen something that has one kind of effect also have another kind of effect. 
um, it's a little confusing because he'll say something like, you know, um, we know in the past whenever there's been a flame, there's been heat. But what does it mean that there's been a flame? Uh, presumably in that sentence, it means we've seen a flame, right? So it's like we're inferring from the visible appearance to the tangible experience of heat. From the fact that I see a certain glowing shape, I infer that if I got closer, I would feel heat. So, um, so I mean, we're really what we're really thinking is that whatever caused the visible impression also will cause heat under the right circumstances. But in any case, what, however this works exactly, um, the, the way it works is by constantly seeing the same things together. Every time I saw this visible appearance, I felt heat, if conditions were correct anyway, if I was close enough, etc. cetera. Um, so, um, but, how do we know that things that we've constantly seen together in the past we'll see together again? Um, right? What's the status of that principle? The principle of induction, as it's sometimes called, right? Like, what is the status of the principle that says if you've seen things go together enough, then you should expect them to always go together? And Hume says, well, um, number one, it's not demonstrable. And this point itself shows that it's not demonstrable, right? Because this point says we only learn general principles about matters of fact from experience. This is a general sphere principle about matters of fact. Whenever you see th two things together over and over, uh, you, you know, uh, you'll always see them together, something like that. So this also can only be learned from experience. That is, you know, again, assuming we're sure this is right. So, um, so, so you say, okay, maybe we learned it from experience. But this principle is the principle that tells us that you can learn things from experience. Right? I mean, this principle is the principle that says that if you experience things, you can learn what they usually do or what they always do. We couldn't learn it from experience. We need the principle itself to learn anything from experience. So Hume concludes that we don't know that, we, we don't either have a demonstration of that principle or a proof of it from experience. So, um, we don't have a right to claim that that principle is, is true. <laughs> we didn't get it from anywhere. That is, we didn't get it from any process, by any process of reasoning. We didn't figure out that it's true either by proving it from first principles somehow, or by, you know, um, learning through our experience that it works. Therefore, we didn't figure out that it's true at all. But, so therefore, we don't have a good reason to believe that general principle. But without that general principle, we don't have a good reason to believe anything we learned from experience. And without a um, reason to believe anything we learn from experience, we don't have a reason to believe that there's any connection between a present fact and a remote fact. And without that, we don't have a reason to believe any remote fact.
right? So that's why this is a skeptical argument. The conclusion is, therefore, you shouldn't believe anything about remote facts. You don't have a reason to believe them. So that's the skeptical problem that he raised in section four. And then in section five, he gives what he calls the skeptical solution to this problem. So the skeptical solution is, this is on page 30. By the way, does everyone understand the argument? Or are there questions about it? Um, this is the skeptical solution. All belief of matter of fact or real existence is derived merely from some object present to the memory or senses and a customary conjunction between that and some other object. So, um, so what that means is we don't have a reason What we have is a tendency, once we get used to a certain conjunction, to um, believe in matters of fact according to that conjunction, right? So like, for example, once we get used to feeling heat when we get near enough to something that looks like fire, um, we get in the habit of believing that there will be heat when we see that appearance. And that's why we believe that if we get close to the fire, we'll feel the heat. So it's a skeptical solution because it's, um, it explains why we believe it, but not by giving us a reason to believe it, just by saying, um, um, yeah, it's not reason. It's this other principle of custom or habit that makes us believe it. Someone asks, you know, what are your reasons? We don't have one to give. But that's what we do because uh, we tend to, you know, get in the habit of expecting certain things. So that's basically part one of section five. Um, and um, I'm, I'm going to come back and talk about it in more detail. But first of all, I want to talk about what he does, does in part two of section five, which is um, where he explains what belief is in general or really, I guess he argues what belief must be in general um, in a way that's consistent with this skeptical solution that explains why um, this is what we would do, reason or no reason. This is the kind of thing we would believe based on analysis of what belief actually is. Um, So I think, you know, as Hume says, um, the, the skeptical problem and the skeptical solution don't depend on his theory of what belief is. Um, his theory of what belief is 
just gives, so to speak, a deeper explanation of why there's this principle of custom or habit. Um, um, and therefore, he actually suggests that if you're not into abstruse arguments, you can skip, skip part two of section five and go on with the rest of the book. Um, I'm not sure if that's entirely true. I don't think you would understand the rest of the book the same way, at least if you hadn't read part two of section five. But anyway, I am into abstruse arguments, unfortunately for you. So, um, so I actually am really interested in what happens in part two. So, so now I'm going to uh, talk about that. So this is Hume's theory of belief. So the argument starts with this. What's the question, what's the difference between fiction and belief? Right? That is, what's the difference, for example, between imagining that I'll feel heat and expecting to feel heat? Believing that I'll feel heat. Um, I mean, they can both be, he emphasizes this, which think is some kind of point against Locke, although I'm not sure I understand exactly. But anyway, he emphasizes that you, even when you imagine something, you can attach it to a, sp a particular point in time and space, right? So I can imagine going up to the fire and feeling heat as a fiction, or I can take the same ideas of going up to the fire and feeling heat and believe that that's going to happen. Oh, now, wait, I see there's a question in that chat. Can you briefly explain what, according to Hume, is a matter of fact? Yes, I, I tried to explain that last time, but I can try to explain it again. Um, um, so, um, not sure which is the, so, okay, so here's two ways of answering the question, what according to Hume is a matter of fact. So one way would be to say, um, like, a matter of fact is something that just happens to be the case. We don't know any reason why it has to be the case. Um, but as a matter of fact, it is the case. So a question of matters of fact is a question not about what is necessarily true, but about what happens to be true. Um, so, you know, when we say... Uh, the interior angles of a triangle add up to two right angles, we think, and Hume, at least in this book, seems to be agreeing that um, um, we think that is, you know, we 18th century people anyway think that um, we're saying something that uh, um, doesn't depend on what happens to be true about the world. It's true even if there are no triangles, it's still true that if there were a triangle, that interior angles would add up to two right angles. Um, so, and it certainly doesn't depend on exactly what triangles there are or, you know, Whereas if you say, like, uh, you know, Julius Caesar crossed, crossed the Rubicon or whatever, um, or there's a refrigerator in the next room, um, you're, you're talking about something that we think is true, but we don't see any reason why it had to be true. It could have not been true. So, I mean, that's what he's trying to get at, I think. He explains what that necessity is that we're contrasting matter of fact is by contrasting questions about matters of fact with questions about relations of ideas, right? That is, he says, well, you know, what do you mean it had to be true? And he says, well, you must mean that uh, if you claimed it wasn't true, you would contradict yourself. <laughs> 
That's how you know it had to be true. So a question of matter of fact is a question where neither the yes, let's say it's a yes, no question, basically, right? Is there a refrigerator in the next room? So like a question of matter of fact is a question where neither the yes nor the no answer implies a contradiction. I mean, that's a pretty, Hume is disagreeing with Locke, but I guess agreeing with Berkeley in saying that, um, and agreeing with most of the rationalists, except, well, all the rationalists, I guess, except, well, that's complicated. But anyway, he, he's, he's disagreeing with Locke. Locke thinks that there's another way that something can be necessary, even if the opposite doesn't imply a contradiction. Um, Right, for example, that triangle example, Locke says it's not a contradiction to say that the interior angles of a triangle don't add up to two right angles. Um, nevertheless, it's necessarily false. But Hume doesn't allow examples like that, so a matter of fact is anything where neither it nor its opposite implies a contradiction. Does that I probably, that wasn't really, that wasn't really brief, but did that answer the question, what is a matter of fact according to Hume? Okay. So back to this belief. So, and the question is, what's the difference between imagining that I will feel heat if I, you know, um, if I go near the heat and believing that I will feel, if I go near the fire and believing that I'll feel heat if I go near the fire. So he says, um, um, and this is the beginning of, of section five, part two, on page 31. Wherein, therefore, consists the difference between such a fiction and belief? It lies not merely in any peculiar idea which is annexed to such a conception as commands our assent. Sorry, it lies not merely in any particular idea which is annexed to such a connection, connection, conception as commands our assent and which is wanting to every known fiction. For as the mind has authority over all its ideas, it could voluntarily annex this particular idea to any fiction and consequently be able to believe whatever it pleases, contrary to what we find by daily experience. Right? So the argument is, so the question is, you know, here's the idea of, of me putting my hand near the fire Here's the idea of me putting my hand near the fire and feeling heat. I guess I would say the mere idea. Maybe I should just call it the imagination or the fancy. <laughs> Here's the fancy that if I'm fancying that if I put my hand near the fire, I feel heat. Here's the belief that if I put my hand near the fire, I'll feel heat. What's the difference between them? And he says, so you might think that the difference is that these two ideas are different. That in addition to the idea of my hand and the idea of heat and the idea of fire and the idea of it happening in the future or whatever that is, this one has an additional idea, which is, you know, the idea of real existence. So when I change from just believe fancying that I my, I'm gonna feel heat and believing that I'm gonna feel heat, the difference is that to this idea of putting my hand near the fire and feeling heat, I add this other idea of real existence. 
And Hume is saying that couldn't be it because I can add whatever idea I want to whatever other idea as long as it doesn't involve a contradiction. Um, and um, so if this idea of real existence were just an idea I can add just like any other, then, uh, you know, suppose I'm feeling kind of cold and I want to believe that if I get near the fire, I'll feel heat. Nothing easier. Just add the idea of real existence to my imagination. Now I believe it. Yay. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and Hume is saying, well, he says, by, we know by experience we can't do that. Now... And, I mean, by the way, it's important to understand what the case he's talking about here is, right? That is, I mean, of course, you can do things to make yourself believe something. You can kind of talk yourself into it or whatever. And I think Hume would be the last person to deny that. Um, but the question is whether you can make yourself believe something just by adding another idea to the idea that you already have. The way, like, if you're imagining a white horse, you can then imagine a unicorn just by adding the idea of the horn in. And his claim is, no, you can't do that. And we know by experience you can't do that. Believing something is not imagining some other thing different than what you were imagining before. It's no longer just imagining that thing, but now believing it. And you can't just do that. So he's saying it's not an extra idea. Now, I mean, again, since, as you recall, I'm kind of rethinking what I think Locke thinks about real existence. I'm not sure to say what, what to say at this point about how this interacts with Locke's theory, but I think, you know, I mean, at least, um, again, like the only kind of relation of ideas that Hume thinks um, we can use for reasoning about things is identity, identity or contradiction. Um, so if there's a special kind of connection between the idea of real existence and the idea that I'm imagining that, you know, namely Locke's fourth kind of agreement between ideas, um, it makes sense that Hume just doesn't believe in that. Um, and I mean, but on the other hand, if Locke does believe in that, that would explain why he's not making this silly mistake. Right? Locke does think there's something that he calls the idea of being or existence, but he actually thinks that it's somehow connected to every idea. So it's like the way it's connected to the idea when you believe it is different. It's the fourth mode of agreement, which Hume doesn't believe in. So somehow the disagreement centers on that. All right, I'm not going to say more about that now because, like I said, I'm really still not 100% sure what I think about Locke. Um, but anyway, you can see from Hume's point of view, I hope, what the argument is. Now, um, or I mean, can you? Again, are there questions about this? So, um, I mean, there's some question about the argument, the way Hume makes it. I mean, how do we really know that the mind has authority over it, all its ideas like this? Maybe this idea is an exception, and I can't just add it. And in fact, there's, there's a worse question than that about this, because it seems like um, Hume doesn't really think it's true that the mind has full authority over all its ideas. So in section 7, where he takes on an argument 
it's kind of like Barclay, uh, but not exactly. But anyway, he takes on an argument that says that we know we get the idea of power because we know that we have the power to cause our own ideas. And he says, well, um, the command of the mind over itself is limited. And switch and skipping down. Sorry, so this is section seven. It's on page 45. Our authority over our sentiments and passions is much weaker than that over our ideas. It's interesting that here he says the mind does have some authority over its sentiment and passions, but anyway, it's weak. And even the latter authority is circumscribed within very narrow boundaries. It's not true that I can imagine whatever I want to. Some things are really hard to imagine. <laughs> Right? I mean, so maybe it's pretty easy to imagine a white horse with a horn sticking out of its head. But, you know, uh, if you make it more complicated, um, bigger, smaller, you know, um, less like things I've ever seen in the past, or like if you change my mood, it make me distracted, tired, whatever, then it's you know, it might be pretty hard for me to imagine certain things. Um, why not just say this idea of real existence is just a really tough idea and we just, we, you know, we find we can't add it. Um, so I think the point is, even though Hume doesn't exactly say this, and in fact Hume makes it, like I said, makes it sound like we just know this from experience. Right? This is contrary to everyday experience. We know we can't um, form beliefs this way just by imagining imagining that it's true. Not just imagining it, but imagining that it's true would be believing it, basically, according to this theory. Right? That's, that's how you could describe this, sort of. You know, here I'm just imagining. What's the difference in just imagining it and believing it? Imagining its real existence. But he was saying, no, that's not believing it. <laughs> um, if that were believing it, then we could believe whatever you want, and we find that we can't believe whatever we want. So, so, uh, so uh, what I was starting to say is, so even though Hume doesn't say this, I think the point is that belief if it's going to count as belief at all, it has to be something that the mind couldn't have that kind of quote-unquote authority over. Right? I mean, um, uh, the point of belief as, as I guess, like the ultimate point of belief, as Hume emphasizes, is that belief, like believing that I would feel heat if I put my ear near the fire, as opposed to imagining it, believing it is going to change what I do. Um, given what I want, it's going to change what I do. So, like, if I want to feel heat, and I believe this, then I'm going to put my hand near the fire. But if what I believe itself was something I could change depending on what I want, then it wouldn't be fit to play that role. Right? Because it has to be something that, you know, um, I decide what I want, and then I consult what I believe in order to decide what to do. Um... So I think that's what he's thinking about it. Um, and I think from that point of view, you can say more generally that it's something, it can't be something that just follows from my mere ideas um, according to laws of association or any other law. Um, it has to be something that um, um, can interrupt my, you know, internal deliberation and say, here's the fact. That's what you have to deal with. Something like an impression, 
right? So remember that ideas all have this connection of association between them. And I think, you know, when you look at it strictly, Hume is going to say that the mind's quote-unquote authority is just another example of that. It means basically that a certain kind of volition, like a certain kind of idea t that we call a volition, tends to be followed by... Um, um, a certain kind of complex idea that we wanted to make. Um, but anyway, so leaving that aside, so the point is like what can be, what can be absolutely proof against? So this is the idea of real existence. This can't be right. So what can be absolutely proof against the mind having authority over it? And basically, it has to be something like an impression. And in fact, so Hume says that um, belief is, must be a sentiment or feeling. Um, right, this is the next paragraph on page 31 below the passage I was just reading. It follows, therefore, that the difference between fiction and belief lies in some sentiment or feeling which is annexed to the latter, not to the former, and which depends not on the will, nor can be commanded at pleasure. Right, so, that, I, you know, basically I'm, I'm sort of saying is that that's kind of... Um, and it's interesting because this is not part of Hume's official definition of the difference between impressions and ideas. Remember, there were um, two differences. One was that impressions are more vivid, and the other was that um, ideas can't come unless they're copies of previous impressions. Maybe that second one is somehow supposed to include or account for this. But anyway, there's another difference which is really important, which is that um, ideas at least sometimes follow on the will. And I'm claiming that's a subcase of the way that they follow the laws of association. But anyway, ideas at least sometimes follow on our will. Impressions do not. So, um, so now, maybe, no, didn't have to draw that twice, but now that it's crossed out, I'll draw it again. Only worse this time. So, <laughs> that's really good. Here's the flame. Here's the heat of the flame. Right? And this is the fancy or imagination. So what is the belief? The belief has all those parts in it. It's the same idea. It's the same idea, but next to it is a certain sentiment or feeling. Well, and I'm just going to write here, so a sentiment or feeling um, seems to be, uh, based on the way Hume uses these terms in, in around here in context, seems to be equivalent to a passion. That is, it's a, it's a certain kind of impression, a certain kind of internal impression. Um, he doesn't say here more about what the difference between passions and, um, and, and impressions of sense is. Um, he says more about that in book two of the treatise and in the dissertation on the passions. But anyway, what I'm going to say about it for now is that a passion is a kind of impression. And at least what it sounds like he's saying is now the difference is, yeah, I didn't add an idea which the mind would have authority over. I added this impression, which the mind doesn't have authority over.
Um, and I guess I will say one thing that Hume says in general about passions is that they they're about ideas. They're like impre they're like impressions of reflection. So that kind of fits this picture that the this impression would be a passion about this idea. So it's kind of similar to like being uh, frightened at the idea that I would feel heat if I got close to the fire or being happy at that or whatever. So it's, but instead of being frightened or happy, it's being believing <laughs> at that idea. Um, now, um, what, what kind of, so, I mean, I'm actually going to kind of take that back later, but at first it seems like that's what he's saying. So what kind of impression or impression is this, however? So Hume says, you know, um, you can't define impressions. Um, why can't you define impressions? So, like, apparently another difference between impressions and ideas is that Hume agrees with Locke that impressions are simple. Right? That is, they enter the mind simple and unmixed, as Locke would put it. So when he says you, he can't, you can't define an impression, he means you can't define the simple constituents of our sense experience or our inter internal sentiments. So I can't define white or red. And according to Hume also, but this is more controversial, I can't define anger or joy or pain or pleasure. Um, so I'm like, uh, a lot of philosophers have tried, no philosophers, well, actually that's not true. Some philosophers had tried to define white and black at least. But, uh, anyway, in, in the modern period, most of the philosophers agree with Hume that you can't define white or red or the smell of a pineapple or whatever. But, uh, a lot of people think you can define the passions. In fact, there's a whole section in Spinoza's Ethics that's just titled Definitions of the Passions, and then he defines all the passions. <laughs> all right, but so Hume thinks that you can't define it. It's just a feeling you have. But um, you can, well, there's two things. Number one, you can, you can give the circumstances in what it, which it occurs. So, I mean, that's basically the circumstances in which this passion or impression of belief occurs are going to end up being um, customary conjunction plus a present matter of fact, right? So in other words, the skeptical solution to the problem is going to follow from the nature of this impression that we call belief. But Hume says you can also give certain analogies Um, right? So we don't say what it is, but we say something like it's related to this the way something else is related to something else, right? Remember what an analogy or resemblance is like. You know, you say A is to B as C is to D. And you can, so, you know, you may not be able to define A, but Nevertheless, even if someone doesn't know to begin with what you mean by A, you can tell them something about it if they know what C, D, and B are. You can see, well, A is to B as C is to D, and then that tells them something. You might even think that the blind person that Locke knew who um, 
said they had learned that the color scarlet was like the sound of the trumpet, was actually trying to give an, a, maybe a correct analogy like this, right? That they had learned that the color scarlet is to other colors the way the sound of a trumpet is to other sounds. There seems to be something right about that, although I don't know what else to say about it. But in any case, so in this case, the analogy Hume gives, um, and this I think this analogy is helpful, but it's also possibly deceptive, especially if you forget that it's just an analogy. So the analogy Hume gives is to the vividness or brightness of a color. Um, So, um, see, how do I do this? Um, ah, there it is. <laughs> right. So, this is a color wheel. I mean, or a color solid, right? Um, and um, um, when you go around here, this dimension, this direction is called hue, right? The hue changes from red to orange to yellow to blue through violet. The violet part is cut out in this picture and then back to red. Um, I think that's what Hume is calling the shade of a color. So like the missing shade of blue would be one of these like diameters basically, or radii anyway, right? Like leave out a whole shade here. That's the kind of thing that he thinks is an exception to our ability to, to imagine uh, an idea you know, have an idea that's not a copy of a previous impression. But I think what Hume is calling the vividness of the color is what's um, um, called uh, saturation or chroma, which is this direction here. Can you see what my arrow is doing? I think you, I think you can. Right? Anyway, so like as you can see in the middle of the solid, in the middle of the solid it's all gray. It goes from white to black. And then as you go out, the gray slowly changes to, in one sense of bright, brighter or brighter, whatever this color is. That's what Hume is calling vividness. Um, and, you know, so why am I going into so much detail about that? Well, uh, okay, I didn't bring my copy of the treatise here, but I'll show you my notes. I have the quote written down. This is a quote from book one, part three. There oh, we go. When you would any way vary the idea of a particular object, this is its discussion of the theory of the similar or identical theory of belief in the treatise. When you would any way vary the idea of a particular object, you can only increase or diminish its force and vivacity. If you make any other change in it, it represents a different object or impression. The case is the same as in colors. A particular shade of any color may acquire a new degree of liveliness or brightness without any other variation. But when you produce any other variation, it is no longer the same shade or color. Right, so, I guess, so the analogy is supposed to be this. The analogy is that... Um, Oh, 
again is the color sign. So like the radius like this is the shade of a color. So Hume is saying, and by the way, I don't know what to say about this dimension, which is what's now called brightness or lightness. But anyway, um, so just forget about it. <laughs> so a radius like this is a shade of the color. So Hume is saying, you know, um, if you change to a different hue, to a different radius here, you're changing shade of the color, and therefore it's a completely new idea. That's why the missing shade of blue example, if it's true, is a counterexample, because the missing shade of blue is a different idea from all the other shades of blue. So if I've never had an impression of that shade of blue, I'm now having an idea of an impression that I never had before. But Hume says, um, that's when you go this way. But Hume says in that passage, when you go this way, when you increase or diminish the vividness or liveliness of the idea, uh, of that color, it's not a different idea. It's the same idea to a different degree, so to speak. So that's a claim about ideas of color. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's interesting in its own right, but uh, why Hume thinks that, um, um, I, I guess, you know, um, based on that, you can, under, you can understand why, like, it wouldn't be a counterexample that if you've seen every degree of brightness of a certain shade of blue except one, and you said, oh, Hume, but I can imagine that shade of brightness too, that, that vividness of that shade as well, Hume will say, well, that's just the same idea. It's a copy of that same impression. You're only adjusting how much of it there is. Um, I mean, this is especially interesting in connection with Kant because Kant is going to claim that all sensations, or at least what they represent, is always a matter of degree. And uh, Hume, at least in the case of color, seems to agree with that. Which, and it's, and you know, Kant is going to say, "How do we know that? Isn't that already a piece of knowledge that we didn't get from experience?" Anyway, be that as it may, um, the, the main point is. This, this is an analogy, and it's not a perfect analogy. It's not a perfect analogy um, because of what I just said. I can imagine a more vivid color than the one I've seen. At least Hume seems to think so. I guess I can. I don't know what I can really imagine. Or not. But um, Hume seems to think, I can, yeah, I definitely can imagine a more vivid color than I've ever seen before. Um, or, well, yeah, than I've, than I've ever seen before, I guess would be the test. Um, so, uh, um, so that would be something the mind does have authority over. And moreover, it doesn't seem, you know, Hume says that this is a different degree of the same idea. He doesn't say that it's like attached to another impression or something like that. That would be strange. Right? That would mean that every time that I have a color impression or idea, there's another impression next to it, which is an impression of how vivid it is or something like that. That's a strange thing to say, and Hume does not say that. Um, so, so the analogy is not perfect, and you certainly, and you especially, like, shouldn't get confused and think that what Hume is saying is that the difference between this and this is that here I imagine the fire being brighter or something like that. That, again, would be something the mind has authority over, right? So I would be, you know, like, here I would be imagining this kind of dim fire and this kind of, like, faint heat, and then in order to believe that there really will be heat, all I have to do is imagine the heat getting stronger, 
That's definitely what, not what he means. But it's something like that kind of vividness. Namely, it's something that can vary while the idea itself remains the same. That's the analogy. It's something where it can be more or less of the idea, so to speak, while the idea remains the same. Nothing, no other idea has been added to it or taken away from it. So, um, okay, so that's the analogy. Now, um, now let me come back to this picture and ask, um, how to understand it exactly, or whether I drew this picture correctly. I mean, after saying all of that, drawing that analogy and so forth, it's kind of confusing. It seems like we're saying two things about this idea compared to this one. Number one, there's more vividness somewhere in here. And number two, there's this a next sentiment or feeling that is inward impression. Um, now, I mean, first of all, that's puzzling because why didn't we need both of them? kind of see a possible answer to that. Why do we need both of them? It has to be something that it's not under the mind's authority. That's the impression. But no, because that, see that, so okay, this is what I was thinking, it's something like this. The difference is that, number one, this idea is more vivid in some weird dimension than this idea. Right? In other words, not that the colors are brighter and the heat is stronger or something, but it's more vivid in some other way. <laughs> Hume says, you know, the proper name for this is belief. Right? We, you know, so uh, like, it's more believable, right? But anyway, it's more vivid in some way. And then number two, the reason the mind doesn't have authority is because it's not belief until we get an impression of how vivid it is. But if the mind had authority over this, it would be able to make this impression happen, right? Just by making this more vivid, then we would get the impression that it's more vivid. At least that would be one way of trying to understand how they go together. On the other hand, I guess you might think that there's always an impression of every idea. So that would bring, be bringing back this thought that just like every color always has another impression attached to it. There's always an impression attached to every idea, only this is a more vivid impression. So the vividness would not be vividness of the idea, but of the impression. I mean, that's not what Hume actually says. He says the idea is more vivid and lively. Um, and it's also weird because if there's an impression attached to every idea or impression, presumably, then there has to be an impression attached to this impression too, you might think, and then it's an infinite regress. So I actually think neither of these is right, and that this picture isn't exactly right. Um, and therefore, that when Hume says there's a sentiment or feeling annexed to it, that isn't exactly right either. It's also an imperfect analogy of some kind. It's not really something else attached to it. But I'm going on a limb here because I don't have really like clear text from Hume where he says what I'm about to say. So, like, I mean, this is something about, I mean, you may not feel, and maybe rightly so, not feel comfortable doing something like this when you're writing a paper or whatever. But this is part of trying to understand. I mean, it's this is like a riskier and bolder version of the little thing I'm asking you to do on the second writing assignment. 
Ray, like Hume doesn't say something or doesn't say something satisfactory to me about a certain question. So I try to imagine if I brought my objections to Hume, what would he say or what could he say that would make sense of this? So now I'm like, you know, it's based on reading the text and even reading the text carefully. Like, remember I said, you know, he doesn't actually say the impression is more vivid. He says the idea is more vivid. Like, you have to notice stuff like that. So it's based on reading the text carefully, but at a certain point you're doing something else. You're, you know, you're, you're speaking on Hume's behalf, as I put it in the assignment. Um, I think historians and maybe at least a certain kind of uh, uh, like literature people look askance at philosophers when we do this. They're like, what are you talking about? He doesn't say that. No one ever asked him this question. What do you mean, what would he say if you asked him this question? <laughs> Right? It's not history. and it, I mean, it's not, right? Like at this point, I'm using Hume to think something. I'm trying to think using Hume's um, framework, using his terminology, but trying to think something that if he, if he thought it at all, he didn't say it explicitly. Okay, anyway, that was kind of a digression, but perhaps more important than as I often say about the depressions, they may be more important than the rest of the lecture. But anyway, so back to what I was going to say. So Hume doesn't say this, and you can't draw a picture of this, really, which I think is why Hume is reduced to saying something like this instead. But I think the idea is that um, belief is like the impression-like strength of an idea. So it's like an aspect of the idea in which it's close to or far from being an impression, or it's the aspect of the idea in which it has some of the force or vivacity that an impression has. Remember, that was supposed to be the big difference between impressions and ideas, that all or almost all, but anyway, let's say all impressions have a superior vivacity and liveliness over any idea. The ideas are all, so to speak, fainter copies. So I think, you know, what this vivacity is, is the, like, impression likeness of the idea. So impressions, which are perfectly impression-like, are completely outside our quote-unquote power. Um, again, section seven, he's going to claim we don't really have an idea of power exactly. That's why I keep putting in quotes. They're completely not under our authority. They don't follow our volitions or other ideas according to, we have to wait and see what they are. And the same is true of ideas in whatever respect they're like impressions. So, in other words, um, um, every idea has kind of like an impressionness likeness, <laughs> impressionness to it. This one has less impressionness, and this one has more impressionness. And we can change the idea insofar as it's an idea. We can add ideas, you know, subtract them, change the degree of colors, etc. But what we can't change is this impressionness of the idea, how close it is to being an impression. What does that depend on then? If it doesn't depend on our volitions, or as I'm saying in general, doesn't, doesn't depend on the train of our previous ideas, the answer is that depends on impressions. And this... Um, all is going to go back into explaining why there must be, given what belief is, 
there must be a kind of principle like the one that forms the skeptical solution to the problem. So, right, so the, the, the problem is, like, why is it that we believe things about remote matter's effect, not based on any reasoning, but only based on our previous experience of matter's effect? And the reason is because what determines how impression-like an uh, idea is, is, it's, is our previous train of impressions, not our previous train of ideas. So just like the impressions themselves don't follow from our ideas, rather vice versa, the ideas don't follow from other ideas um, as far as their impression likeness goes. Right, so it could be like any amount of weird associations that brought up this idea of I can't go near the fire and feeling heat. But in order for it to count as belief, it has to get something that can't come from my ideas. It has to come from previous impressions. Okay. Um, that's my best take for the moment on Hume's theory of belief. This is different, from again, from what I said last year. Last year, I was still trying to make sense of the idea that there was this impression annexed to the idea that makes it a belief, and I just decided that doesn't work. There's no way to make sense of that, and I'm thinking of this other way instead. Other questions about that? This is right. This is also an example of the kind of thing that I asked you to do on the first writing assignment. Um, give two different interpretations and give some arguments for both. Right? It may be that in the end, the arguments, uh, like, for for one, seem to be strong enough that you adopt that one. At least, I'm not very certain, right? But I kind of think this is what Hume means now. But I gave arguments for the other one, too. The strongest argument being that Hume doesn't say what I'm saying. <laughs> it sounds like he's saying the other thing, right? That's a pretty strong argument. But that argument doesn't always win. Um... um for a lot of reasons, um, but in this case, you know, one reason I can point to is, yeah, it's really hard to talk about this accurately. When I started drawing this little thermometer in there, that's not a very good analogy either. It's not, like, it, again, it's not anything annexed to it. It's the whole character of this idea insofar as it's like an impression or not. So it's like, it's hard to say this. And, you know, maybe Jim is doing his best to say it. Or maybe he has reasons for not trying to say it more accurately. Or, you know, um, or maybe he's not 100% consistent is also something, it's kind of a last resort, even though we know that everyone, no one is 100% consistent. <laughs> Nevertheless, it's kind of, it at least should be a last resort of an interpreter, I think, a philosophical interpreter anyway. But there is that possibility, too. You can say, yeah, Hume said that there, but it, overall, that's not his theory. Okay, anyway, um, that was another long digression. Um, if there are no questions about this, I'm going to go back to the skeptical solution and try to say a few more things about it. <sighs> so... Okay, so the evidence for the skeptical solution 
I mean, in a way, the evidence for the skeptical solution, and I guess this is why it is a skeptical solution, is kind of the same as the argument for the skeptical conclusion in the first place. Um, but this is how he begins... Right, so in this paragraph here, this is page 27, the be near the beginning of, of section 5, part 1. So here in this paragraph up here, he's been saying, uh, like, um, okay, so I've just shown, and I'm not going to refute this, that, again, why it's a skeptical solution. I've just shown that we have no reason for believing in matters of fact. We have no proof that they're true. Um, that our beliefs about matters of fact are true. And then he says, you know, of course, maybe I shouldn't text you. He says, um, don't worry that this is going to make people suddenly stop believing in matters of fact. Right? That it's going to make people stop eating because, you know, we don't know as a matter of fact that this bread will nourish the way bread did in the past and so on and so forth. Um, Hume says, you know, don't worry that that's going to happen because true, it's not reason that makes us believe these things, but it must be some other principle that's really, really strong. <laughs> After all, we always believe it. At least, almost always. Um, so, uh, um, so the only question is, what is the principle? It's not reason. What is the principle? And so he begins looking for the principle by saying, suppose a person, though endowed with the strongest faculties of reason and reflection, to be brought on a sudden into this world. He would indeed immediately observe a continual succession of objects and one event following another, but he would not be able to discover anything farther. So this really is just, like I said, it's coming back to one of those points that was made in the skeptical argument. Um, namely, that um, we learn about connections only from experience. So if I was just brought into this world, and it, that is, had had no experience before, I wouldn't know what to expect to come after what. Um, So the question, I mean, I, I already talked about this last time at the end a little bit. I feel like there's something I still don't understand about the division of labor between section four and section five. Anyway, let me just talk about this now, uh, even if maybe I could have talked about it before too. So, um, like... Uh, how do we know that if I was just brought into the world, I would, um, on a sudden, I would not know anything other than the succession of, that there was a succession of changes. Namely, I wouldn't know what to expect next or what to think had happened before I was brought into this world, etc. Um, so, you know, what he says there on page 27 is... Um... 
The particular powers by which all natural operations are performed never appear to the senses. So, right, that has to do with the picture I drew last time where we have, like, um, So we have something that we take to be the effect of some unknown power, but the power itself never appears to the senses. Now we want to predict what other effects it's going to have. But we don't know, because the only thing we know about it is it caused this effect. We don't see the power itself, or otherwise sense it, so we don't know anything else about it other than it caused this effect. So we can't know what other effect it will cause. And the question I was asking last time is, OK, um, why are we so sure that if I was brought into sudden into this world, it, um, I might not that time happen to see the, the particular power with my senses? So, you know, like the thought that I could is kind of Locke's picture, right? If we think of this secret power, or, you know, this non-sensible power that, that, arrive, that gives rise to this effect, and we're going to learn later, also gives rise to this effect. If we think of it as this texture, motion, figure of minute parts, then um, what Hume says isn't exactly right. You have to say, if you were brought into this world on a sudden with the same kind of um, rough senses that we have, you wouldn't know what to expect because our senses never reveal the particular powers that cause the effects. But if our senses were much better, so if I could be brought into this world of a sudden with really good microscopic eyes, and then I would know. Um, So, I mean, in chapter 7, when Hume talks about the idea of power in general, he says something, I mean, more than one thing, but he says at least one thing that makes it sound like it's worse than that. The problem is, rather than Locke's picture, it's Barclay's picture. Power is not something that could be evident to the senses. So, um, which from Hume's point of view, what would that have to mean? It would have to mean that um, it's a contradiction. It implies a contradiction to say, I directly sense a power. Barclay, of course, does think that, right? Barclay says that explicitly. It's a contradiction in terms to say that um, um, my idea is a power. Ideas are inert. So, um, Hume doesn't say that anywhere, but sometimes he seems to get close to saying it. So like here, when we, when we look about us towards external objects and consider the operation of causes, we are never able in a single instance to discover any power or necessary connection, any quality which binds the effect to the cause and renders the one an infallible consequence of the other. And so here I think the question is, 
is such a quality, is it conceivable to find such a quality? And again, you know, so I'm not sure. Again, in that quote, it kind of sounds like Hume is saying, we've never sound, found one so far, maybe we will. But I, f I don't know, maybe that is what he thinks. Um, But um, given what he thinks qualities are like, it does seem kind of inconceivable. What kind of quality, right? So these effects are impressions. What kind of quality could an impression have that would render necessary some other impression? That, again, is what, you know, Barclay says is impossible. And Hume does say in lots of places there can be no necessary connection between ideas, between distinct ideas. Again, I guess the question is just, does he really think it's absurd, or does he just think, so far we've never seen one? Um, Well, um, assuming it is supposed to be inconceivable, here's an argument against that. Here's the first impression. Here's the second impression. Why can't this one have, so to speak, uh, quality of effectness. <laughs> it refers back to this one. How is that worse than, than what Hume actually thinks there is? So, right, so if this were right, then um, when we got this impression and this impression, then we formed ideas of both of them. Call this A and this B, and here's the idea of A. And the idea of B. The idea of B would would continue to have a certain quality of dependence on the idea of A. And so we would be able to infer A from B. So uh, again, Hume thinks at least that doesn't happen, but it seems like maybe something stronger like that couldn't happen. But why is that quality? So this is what Hume actually thinks happens. Um, we get these impressions together. Therefore, when we get A, it, we're, it is, it's associated with B, so we get B. Now suppose... Um, or I'm going to put the other way since I'm trying to infer this direction. We get B, it's associated with A, so we also get A. Now, suppose instead of the idea of B, we get the impression of B. Then um, B, because it's now associated with A, gets a certain quality of like impressionlessness from its association with B. So I guess the question is, why is this like, kind of relation of effectiveness between B and A worse than this relation of like um, 
um, relatedness to present impression that A has to have to get its vividness from B. I didn't understand this in the right order. But, okay, let me just keep going. So, right, I guess, why am I asking why is this better than this? Because in Chapter 7, when Hume asks, asks so where do we get an idea of power? So, right, so in chapter five, his, his conclusion about why we believe remote matters of fact is because of this process. We believe a remote matter of fact because we've acquired a habit of associating these two ideas, A and B. And now when we get an impression of B, it's associated with A, and so the vividness of the impression gets spread to A due to A's relatedness to the present impression. Right, so like I'm in a desert country, to use his example. So he says, suppose I'm just walking in a desert country. Des desert here just means deserted, right? like desert island. It doesn't mean like cactuses and stuff, right? So suppose I'm walking in a desert country. Um, I can imagine that there was once, it was once inhabited, but I don't have no tendency to believe it. Now, all of a sudden, I see the remains of pompous buildings, as he puts it. So now, I start to believe that it was once inhabited. So the belief is founded on two things. Number one, the present impression of the pompous buildings. And number two, the association I formed in experience between pompous buildings and human beings. Right, so in the past, whenever I saw pompous buildings, there were human beings there before who made the pompous buildings. Of course, that's not really true. Most of the time, I didn't see them being built. But anyway, something like that, something a some more complicated version of that. Um, so now I see the pompous buildings. It suggests to me the idea of human beings building them. But I, now I don't just imagine human beings building them. Because since this is an impression, Right, like, so if I was walking in the desert country and I imagined pompous buildings, then I might also imagine people building them. The association would still hold, but it wouldn't make me believe in them. But now that I see the pompous buildings, it not only suggests to me that I should imagine the people, but it also transmits some of its vividness to the idea of the people. Right? That's, so that's the explanation. And again, the explanation of what belief is in, sec, in part 5, section 2, or section 5, part 2, um, is, um, is supposed to give a kind of deeper explanation of why that is what belief is. Um, but anyway, that's how it's supposed to work. Then in chapter 7, when he asks, where do we get the idea of power? And he goes through all these suggestions and rules them out. He says, well, we don't get the idea of power from seeing bodies knock against each other because, um, you know, as Barclay says, we see one thing happen and then we see another thing happen, but we don't see any energy or necessity that made the second thing happen. We just see one after the other. So... Um, and again, right, this is the point where Locke is going to say, no, we see a visible necessary connection in that simple case of, like, bodies colliding. So, um, um, 
So he rules that out, and then he says, well, maybe we get the idea from our ability to move our own bodies. And he says, no, that's just more of the same. First, we have an idea of volition. Then we have the idea of our body moving. But we don't know what the connection is. We, we experience one after the other, but we don't understand the energy that makes it happen. And he has a lot of arguments to try to show that we don't, right? Like that, for example, we don't know how it happens. Between me, you know, wanting to move my arm and my arm moving, all kinds of stuff has to happen, right? Like nerves have to fire and whatever. And I don't know anything about that. I mean, I know a little bit about it, but uh, but I don't know anything specific about it. Right. So um, if so, obviously. Uh, all I really know is that when I want my move, my hand to move, usually it moves. But I don't know why. I don't have that kind of rationalist explanation that makes it necessary to think one after the other. And Hume says the same thing, and that was the passage that I read you before from chapter 7. Hume says the same thing applies to my command over my own thoughts. I don't know how it happens. So then Hume says his answer is, this is the impression that we get the idea of power from. It's this impression of relatedness to a present impression, <laughs> right? It's, it's um, we get the idea of power not from observing necessary connections between ideas, but from observing our tendency to believe things that are associated with present impressions. And that's why I was saying, why is this? as a source of the idea of power better than this. Why not say, um, you know, um, when we first get the impressions, we do see that one depends on the other. So I think the difference is supposed to be that that in Hume's view, there really isn't another idea here, the idea of power that comes in between, right? Like the way we conclude from B to A is not by saying, oh, well, B has this feeling here. That's called power. And whenever we see power, we can infer from the thing that has the power to, the, or well, whichever way it goes here, I guess these are the people, and these are the pompous buildings. We can infer from the thing that has the power to, oh, sorry, we can infer from the effect of the power to the thing that has the power, right? That's not how it works. There isn't an intermediate idea. We feel the easy transition to the belief in the people who made the buildings. And so when we say we think the only people have that power, what we really just mean is, it's just another way of saying, again, we're in the habit of associating these ideas, so when we get an impression of this one, we believe this one. Whereas this is trying to introduce a special new idea of a relationship between these two ideas, and Hume says there is no, there is no such idea. Um, I wanted to say more about this. I especially wanted to say something about how Hume would respond to Barclay's claim that, or to Barclay's way around this, because Barclay says, sure enough, we don't have an idea of power. There's no such thing as an idea of power. We represent power by being power. So, uh, I mean, um, I'm out of time, so I won't say much about it, but I just want to say that um, I think all those arguments that show how limited our power is and that we learn those limits only from experience are supposed to show that we really aren't a power. Um, <clears throat> 
right? That if, if what we were was a power to cause ideas, then um, we wouldn't have to find out which ideas we can cause and which we can't. I think that's what Hume is arguing, and it's similar to an argument that Descartes makes in the Third Meditations, but I don't really have time to go into that. Um, all right. I'm sorry, I feel like that wasn't as put together at the end as it could have been, but I, I, I hope that was somewhat helpful anyway, and I will um, see you not on Tuesday, but as I announced last week, because it says in the syllabus, I'll see you next on Wednesday at this time. Okay. <laughs>